Good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, making this video on behalf of, uh, of my sister and of a sibling who has lost somebody um, who overdosed um, on street drugs. The reason I'm making this video is because I noticed that there are not a lot of videos about grieving siblings. Um, rather, it be somebody um, who was murdered by a gun or was beat to death or was stabbed to death, or rather it was somebody who um, died from street drugs or opiates that were prescribed to them through a doctor. This is probably one of the hardest videos I got to make. Um, today is January 7th, 2018. Um, on January 12th of 2017 was the last time my sister had breath in her body. The last time I saw my sister was New Year's Day of 2017. She spent the weekend with me. We actually had a wonderful time. Um, she lived in another state with her daughter. She was up here visiting. She had been clean. Um, probably, I want to say, a year that she had been clean um, from using street drugs. Um, she came up here. Well, let me, let me rewind a little bit. She was here for the New Year's weekend. We spent the weekend together. We had a great time. We had a wonderful time. We sang together. We ate together. We laughed together. Um, listened to music together. She cleaned my house, and I had to tell her to sit down. There was nothing else to clean, because at that time, I was living in the studio. Um, and on Christmas, uh, New Year's Day, my son and her two children um, came over, and I made dinner. And she left, packed up some stuff. I made extra food. She took it to her oldest son. Um, and that was the last time that I seen her. But we had discussed that she was going to come up the following week. Um, she wanted to take me and my friend to dinner. So that Tuesday came, and I missed a call from my sister. Now we're fast forwarding to February 9th. Um, I'm sorry, January 9th of 2017. And uh, I missed my sister's call, and I tried to call her, and I couldn't get her to answer. And I just figured, okay, she's, uh, you know, hanging out with her friends or whatever, and she'll call me when she's ready for dinner. Um, I did get that call from her daughter. That was a Tuesday, Wednesday night. I got a call from her daughter asking me had I seen her mom, and I said no. She told me that her mom um, was supposed to be on the... the um, train that Thursday morning, which would have been February the, I'm sorry, I keep saying February, January the 12th, she would have been on that train to go back to Kentucky. And I told my niece, I said, don't worry about your mom if she misses the train, because that's what my niece was worried about. Actually, I think it was the bus. My niece was worried about her missing the bus. I said, don't worry about it. She's going to, she's going to get back. Um, don't worry about it. Fast forward to Thursday. January 12th of 2017. It was about a quarter to seven in the morning. And I got a phone call from somebody who I thought at that time in the morning was calling to tell me something other than what they were telling me. Uh, what they were calling to tell me was I needed to get to this building where my sister used to live. And um, first thing I asked was, was my sister okay? The lady told me, Don, you just need to get to the building. Second thing I asked was, is she, is she, uh, did somebody murder her? And they said, no. I said, is she okay? They said, no. And right there, um, I just, I just lost it. I lost it because she's my oldest sister. You, you see her behind me. This is my, my dedication to her. But, and if you see this picture up here, this was actually the last picture that we took. Um, and that was on, that was on New Year's, New Year's Day, excuse me, of 2017. Um, fast forward, uh, well, actually, let me, let me go back before I fast forward, and I'm sorry, uh, jumping all over the place in this video, but I need to get so much across, and I want people to understand the effects of losing somebody to an overdose, because it's real, it's serious, and it hurts just as much as anybody else when they lose anybody in any type of way. Um, especially because it's unexpected. Um, I went to the house where my sister was at. And um, one of the Chicago police officers that I know 
asked me to leave. I mean, I went upstairs. I didn't want to view my sister. I did. I thought that I did. Um, I walked upstairs and I stopped short of where my sister was. She was in the kitchen area and there was a, a sheet up on the doorway. That's just because that's the way the people lived. And um, I stopped short and I said to my sister, Artie, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here, Artie. And I wanted her spirit to know that I was there. I was there. I couldn't take her home because I always saved her. She always called me when she was in trouble and I always helped her out. But she didn't call me this day. But I needed her spirit to know that I was there. And so I left because one of my friends who's a Chicago police officer, he didn't want me to see her. So he asked me to leave because he didn't want me to see my sister being carried out in a body bag. Uh, and that was probably the best thing uh, that I probably could have done was not seeing her. Um, I did, however, go on my own to the medical examiner's office and I didn't have to because when, you, uh, when you're a victim of an overdose, you don't have to be identified. Only if you're a victim of a homicide do you have to be identified at the medical examiner's office. But because of the work that I do, I went on my own and I didn't tell anybody. I was going and I still didn't tell our kids or my other siblings that I went to the medical examiner's office. But I went because I wanted to see her. I didn't want to see her in that house on the floor. But I wanted to see my sister. And after that, I kind of went into a funk. A funk, a deep one, and uh, nobody knew because I'm the type of person that I'm very private and I isolate, and I did that, and I did that, and I, you know, I, I, I myself turned to alcohol and drank every day and came home and isolated myself, um, didn't want to talk to nobody, didn't want to see anybody, didn't care, I was able to function for work, but that was it, um, and... About three months after my sister passed, I uh, was walking down the street and I felt my sister right here on my ear. I felt her say, I heard her say, Don, I'm okay, cut it out. Don, I'm okay, cut it out. And I couldn't do nothing but laugh and say, okay, Artie, I hear you. And after that was when I decided that it was time for me to fight. It was time for me to fight for justice for my sister because somebody sold her some drugs that didn't have a right to sell her any drugs. They're called street doctors and uh, they had no right to sell my sister drugs. I knew there was a charge and I live in Chicago, Illinois, and I knew there was a charge, but I just didn't know what it was. So I started doing some research and I found out about the drug-induced homicide charge which is a law in Illinois that states if anybody knowingly gives or sells a controlled substance to somebody and that person injects it, inhales it, or ingests it and die as a result of that, that person who sold them drugs can be charged with drug-induced homicide. Um, along the way, I also met some people who have experienced what I experienced. I also met a woman who's a Chicago police officer whose stepdaughter overdosed on um, MDA and um, we connected, and we connected, and first thing she asked me was, Don, look at your police report and tell me if it's criminal or non-criminal. When I said non-criminal, that's when I learned a whole lot of things um, that I didn't know. And when they say non-criminal, that means there's no investigation. It's not criminal. So um, <laughs> it's really ironic that that they could put that on there. And so Again, along the way, I've met so many other people, not just in my state, but across the United States. There is a um, Facebook page that's set up. It, it's called Drug Induced Homicide. Drug Induced Homicides Warrant Criminal Investigation. And knowing that that, uh, that charge exists, and there are so many other people in the United States who um, have lost people to drug uh, overdoses, I continued to do research and I found that in Cook County or in, well, yeah, let me just, in Cook County, 
in 2016, 1,080 people died from an overdose. That's just Cook County. Cook County alone. And Chicago was part of Cook County. Um, and I also learned that the surrounding counties, Will County, Kane County, DuPage County, um, Lake County, have all prosecuted, excuse me, have all prosecuted drug dealers for drug-induced homicides. The only one that's being prosecuted here in the city of Chicago, in the city of, in, in the county of Cook, is um, Sydney. And Sydney is the daughter, the stepdaughter of the Chicago police officer who um, died of an overdose of MDA that was given to her. Well, I don't know if it was given to her, but whatever way it was given, sold to her by her cousin and her cousin's adult friend. And her cousin was a juvenile. And learning that there have been 1,080 overdoses and only one, one person, one case in Cook County is being prosecuted criminally as a drug induced homicide really just kind of made me just kind of made me go crazy. So I've done a lot of things to try to change that. Uh, unfortunately, what I got was a lot of finger pointing, a lot of finger pointing. Well, they won't do this and they won't do that. They won't do this and they won't do that. The state won't charge. So the police won't arrest the police say that, Oh, you know, it's hard for us to prove. Well, it's, it's hard for, uh, it's hard for us to get the state to charge it. So what I did was I went and I stopped, I talked to the state's attorney's office. The state's attorney said, well, how do they know what we won't charge if they don't present us with the charges? And I said, okay, so I go back to the police department and now the police are listening to me. Now the detective is listening to me and he starts to investigate and he's been investigating. I have my sister's phone and I've had my sister's phone for the past year. I have text messages from the person who actually set her up with the guy to buy the drugs from. And I have the, te the, the calls and s just a few text messages from the drug dealer, but I have them. So... I was able to meet with the deputy chief of the Chicago Police Department and talk to her. Um, I emailed her, um, asked her for a meeting. She thought the meeting was about my sister, which it was not. It was about other families as well who had lost people to a drug overdose. So when she saw I added people to the email, she called me and asked me who the people were. And I told her who they were. And she said, can you do me a favor? Can you give me 30 days? Give me 30 days. It's not that I'm not interested and I'm not trying to blow you off. Give me 30 days. Um, I want to get a sergeant on this and I, you know, I want to do some research myself. Well, fast forward three months later, that meeting never happened. And now I'm meeting, I'm being met with resistance. Um, and the resistance is, okay, Don, have these other people whose um, loved ones have overdosed, have they reached out to their detectives? Yes, they've reached out to their detectives. One detective in one of the cases told the mother, told the mother that he was retiring and he told her to throw the drugs out evidence. He told her to throw evidence out and he suggested that she be careful how she handles it because the stuff could kill her. Yes. He told her to throw it out. Yes. He told her to be careful how she can handle it, uh, how she handles it because it could kill her. Another woman I met lost her brother. The first woman's name is, uh, son's name is Jay and Anthony is, uh, Tony is, is uh, Valerie's brother. And Sydney is, I think I mentioned Sydney in the beginning. Sydney is the daughter of the Chicago police officer. So here I am. Now we're going to fast forward um, to January 7th. And um, after several after after the 30 day period after the 30 day waiting period which I was asked to wait after several emails back to the deputy chief after several calls back to the deputy chief she finally uh, responded to my email with those questions that I just said a few minutes ago and um she said she couldn't give me information on those because I was not next to Ken. Well, I wasn't asking for any kind of information. I was just asking her to look into those cases because those were two 19 year olds, um, a girlfriend and a boyfriend who died, you know, about 10 months uh, within each other. And um, they were not being investigated. We're talking about two 19 year old kids, boyfriend and girlfriend who, who both died from an overdose and possibly got these drugs from the same person. One of them, one of the young men, uh, Henry was 19. Um, he, he had fentanyl. He, he bought heroin with fentanyl. And so he, I, 
emailed her back and I told her that I knew I couldn't get that information. That's not what I was asking. Um, I, I, I again asked for a meeting with not all of those families, but just myself and the Chicago police officer. Well, I have yet to get a response from that. And I probably won't get a response from that. I'm probably going to be blown off right about this point. But um, it's okay because um, I'm on a mission. And I am on a mission to get justice not only for my sister, for the others who have lost loved ones to an overdose, and also to change the system. I want to change the way that people look at somebody who has died from a drug overdose. I want to change the way people think that, that our loved ones are the scum of the earth because they chose to, to um, use, an, use an illegal drug. That is so far from the truth about people who have the disease of addiction. My sister was a wonderful woman. As a matter of fact, she was 52 years old and we had the conversation that weekend before she died. Artie, Artie, you made it this far. You made it this far. Healthy, not sick, no health problems at all. Get yourself together so you can spend the next 50 or however many years you have on this earth so you can spend them peacefully and, and live it with your children. My sister loved her children. She has two boys and a girl. She loved them, and she has two grandchildren who she loved dearly. She loved them. She just couldn't kick that habit. But she was far from the scum of the earth. And a lot of people that I've met on this journey are far from the scum of the earth. So I want to change things. I want to change the way that people think about drug drugs, um, drug overdoses when you talk about them. And I want to change. I want to change the way that they're investigated here. Not only myself. This didn't start with me. This started actually before me. But I want to change that. I want to change. I want to start. I want to be a part of change. I want to be a part of change in this city and this world where people look at people and say, you know what? You didn't have the right to sell those drugs. So you should go to jail because that person died because you sold them a drug that you had no business selling them. I don't want to hear, oh, well, they chose to take it. It was their option. They, they knew what they were getting into. Absolutely not. One thing I say, and I'm going to continue to say is, yes, my sister wanted to get high, but no, she did not want to die. If she knew that night was the last night of her life, two weeks before her 53rd birthday, she would have never took those drugs. Never. Never. Nor would anybody else's loved one. If they thought that that was going to be the last time that they would ever get high or the last time that they would ever have breath in their body or the last time that they would ever see their loved ones, they would have never taken those drugs. So I stand here, I sit here today in front of this camera because I love my sister. I love my sister. And nobody can take that love that I have for my sister away because they decided to sell her a drug that took her life. Nobody. And I'm going to fight. I'm going to continue to fight, not only for my sister, for your sister, for your brother, for your mother, for your father, for your cousin, for your aunt, for your child, for whoever it is in the city of Chicago, in the county of Cook. And if I have to take my fight all the way to the White House and people are willing to go to go with me, I'm going. Because guess what? The White House is talking about the opiate problem. Everybody is talking about the opiate problem. But nobody is talking about the victims that are losing their lives. You see news reports continuously going out and and showing needles all over the place and you see things like that but you don't see you don't see the families you don't see the families that are left behind to pick up the pieces this past summer I went and got my nephew and had lunch with him he's 23 years old gonna graduate with a with a with a master's degree in psychology I said to him how you doing baby he said I grew up January 12th he said I grew up January 12th and that was the day that my sister died. I sit in front of you and I wear this shirt because my sister was a KISS fanatic. I wore this to her funeral. And I'm going to end, but I want to end with showing you something. This calendar is a calendar that was given to me by my sister for Christmas. And I put it in the closet because it was given to me for Christmas. After my sister passed, 
I was at home and I went to look at the calendar and I realized, oh my God, I need to change the calendar. And um, I remember she gave me this and I remembered that she wrote in it. And so it is actually, uh, you could see this. It's actually stuck on November. I never, I never ever flipped it over to December. Because on December 31st of this cam uh, this calendar, it says, Happy New Year. Here we go again. We're still here. And I couldn't find myself to flip this calendar because she's not here. And we here we we know we don't go again. But she wrote so many things in this calendar for me, including at the beginning of the year. January, th I'm sorry, November 30th, always remember, I love you, your sister Artie, <laughs> on my birthday, <laughs> we are still here sister, don't forget I love you and care for you deeply, your sister Artie, and it's stuck on November. For those of you who decided to watch this video, I really, really, really appreciate you watching my video and allowing me to share my story with you. Again, there are so many others out there who have lost loved ones to violence. I'm sorry, not violence to a drug overdose. I work with uh, families who've lost uh, loved ones to violence. So <sighs> walking this journey with my sister, um, you just, you know, I just didn't expect it because she, because she had lived so long and was getting high and made it. But again, let me end this video by saying I thank you. I appreciate you. For those of you who are walking this journey with me, with us, we love you. We know your loved one didn't want to die. And we hope that you in your city, your state, and your county are asking your local police departments for an investigation into the homicide of your loved one.